Welcome to Trinity Online. Everyone is welcome to take Holy Communion with us. You're going to want to have ready in a little bit some kind of bread or cracker and some kind of wine or juice. The flowers today are brought by Stephanie Kistler. We appreciate uh, her bringing those flowers. They are in thanks to the congregation for your support during her husband Dick's ongoing illness. And now we begin our worship with our gathering hymn. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, the God of manna, the God of miracles, the God of mercy. Amen. Drawn to Christ and seeking God's abundance, let us confess our sin. God, our provider, help us. It is hard to believe there is enough to share. We question your ways when they differ from the ways of the world in which we live. We turn to our own understanding rather than trusting in you. We take offense at your teachings and your ways. Turn us again to you. Where else can we turn? Share with us the words of eternal life and feed us for the life of the world. Amen. Beloved people of God, in Jesus, the manna from heaven, you are fed and nourished. By Jesus, the worker of miracles, there is always more than enough. Through Jesus, the bread of life, 
You are shown God's mercy. You are forgiven and loved into abundant life. Amen. Let us all pray together. O God, our teacher and guide, you draw us to yourself and welcome us as beloved children. Help us to lay aside all envy and selfish ambition that we may walk in your ways of wisdom and understanding as servants of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. The first reading is from the book of Jeremiah. Chapter 11, verses 18 through 20. A reading from Jeremiah. It was the Lord who made it known to me, and I knew. Then you showed me their evil deeds. But I was like a gentle lamb led to the slaughter, and I did not know it was against me that they devised schemes, saying, Let us destroy the tree with its fruit. Let us cut him off from the land of the living, so that his name will no longer be remembered. 
But you, O Lord of hosts, who judge righteously, who try the heart and the mind, let me see your retribution upon them, for to you I have committed my cause. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. The second reading is from the book of James, chapter 3, verse 13, through chapter 4, verse 3, and verses 7 and 8. A reading from James. Who is wise and understanding among you? Show by your good life that your works are done with gentleness born of wisdom. But if you have bitter envy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not be boastful and false to the truth. Such wisdom does not come down from above, but is earthly, unspiritual, devilish. For where there is envy and selfish ambition, there will also be disorder and wickedness of every kind. But the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, willing to yield, full of mercy and good fruits, without a trace of partiality or hypocrisy. And a harvest of righteousness is sown in peace for those who make peace. Those conflicts and disputes among you, where do they come from? Do they not come from your cravings that are at war within you? You want something and you do not have it, so you commit murder. And you covet something and cannot obtain it, so you engage in disputes and conflicts. You do not have because you do not ask. You ask and do not receive because you ask wrongly in order to spend what you get on your pleasures. Submit yourselves therefore to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. Gospel according to Mark, the ninth chapter. Jesus and the disciples went on and passed through Galilee. He did not want anyone to know it, for he was teaching his disciples, saying to them, The Son of Man is to be betrayed into human hands, and they will kill him, and three days after being killed, he will rise again. But they did not understand what he was saying and were afraid to ask him. Then they came to Capernaum, and when he was in the house, he asked them, What were you arguing about on the way? But they were silent, for on the way they had argued with one another who was the greatest. He sat down, called the twelve, and said to them, Whoever wants to be first must be last of all and servant of all. Then he took a little child and put it among them, and taking it in his arms, he said to them, Whoever welcomes one such child in my name welcomes me, and whoever welcomes me welcomes not me, but the one who sent me. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Grace, mercy, and peace from God our Creator and from our risen Savior, Jesus the Christ. Amen. Today we are at Jesus' second passion prediction, smack dab at the heart of the Gospel of Mark. Last week was Jesus' first prediction of his death. Today is the second one, and in a couple weeks we'll have the third. And these passion predictions are bookended by Jesus healing someone from blindness. The Gospel of Mark is like a pool in which someone has dropped a stone and all the ripples are going out uh, in concentric circles from the center. So here's the center of the heart, these passion predictions, and all these circles are going out from that. As we read along in the gospel, we encounter stories that are like these ripples, and somewhere down the line we can expect to see a parallel story on the opposite side. 
But today we're right here in the center where the stone has dropped. The stone is Jesus' prediction of his death and resurrection and a little bit of what it means to be Jesus' disciples um, and for us to follow him. A little bit of example what it means to be healed from a spiritual and moral blindness which keeps us from seeing Jesus and which keeps us from seeing each other. Jesus prediction of his death and resurrection it was it was like a, dro a rock dropped in a pond or maybe like a boulder dropped in a pond uh, it was just this huge splash right in the middle um, of this ministry of the disciples a big disturbance there had been some wind and waves previously some difficulties and struggles the disciples had trouble healing people. They couldn't understand who Jesus was. You know, but they're learning. They're on their way. Um, they're following. They're trying to do the ministry Jesus is giving them. And then Jesus, bam, predicts his death. And if you remember last week, uh, Peter starts arguing with Jesus about it, and Jesus rebukes him and says for him to set his mind on divine things to take up his cross. So, because it's such a hard teaching to understand, we get it three times. It tells us how important this teaching is that Jesus is sharing. So this week, Jesus again predicts his death, and this time he also says he will rise. Now, his disciples there, you know, after last week, Peter's like, I'm keeping my mouth zipped. I'm not saying anything. His disciples are afraid to ask him anything about it. Maybe they feel silly that they don't know what he means by this, Maybe they're so uncomfortable by the idea that Jesus will suffer and die that they don't want to know more. What we do know is that they don't know and they don't ask. Jesus is, in this moment, pouring his heart out to them, and they don't know what to do or say. Instead, they move on to this discussion amongst themselves about who is the greatest. This might have been a childish game of one-upsmanship, trying to outdo each other, be better than each other. Who knows what criteria they would have been using to figure out who's the greatest, who knew Jesus the longest, who healed the most people, or maybe they're just trying to get things clear between them, who would take over when Jesus died. This could have been a very practical conversation about leadership and organization. In any case, Jesus takes them in a to a house any time in the gospel of mark when uh, jesus and the disciples go into a house or a house is mentioned that signifies a church because all their churches were house churches they may be measuring their importance and worth as his disciples out in the world but in the church jesus has another example of what power and leadership looks like jesus says if you want to be the greatest or the first, be last of all and a servant. And this is what it looks like. And Jesus guides a small child and puts that child right in the center, holds that child up as an example. Now I can tell you not one of those disciples looked at that child and saw someone sweet and innocent and lovable. What they saw was a nobody shown to them as an example of greatness in God's kingdom. I picture a kid with a dirty face, messy hair, maybe a skinned knee. This kid uh, doesn't have it all together. Become like this child, Jesus says. Children are needy. They are constantly in need of food and assistance, buckling their sandals. They need to be bathed, clothed, shown the way. They need to be protected and comforted, put to bed, woken up in the morning. And Jesus says, be like a child. Be needy. We're supposed to be self-assured and independent, right? Not in God's house. We come to God because we're poor sinners, unable to provide for ourselves and looking to God, our provider. We come to God because we can't make food grow. Only God can do that. We don't know the way. We're constantly getting lost. Only God can bring us home. We are needy children who are helpless and vulnerable. And we look to God, our Father, to help us. 
How can we admit we need help to God and to each other, like the little child? Children aren't just needy, but they're ready to learn. Children go through life curious about the world. They're looking around. They're asking why. They're asking a million questions. They're soaking up stories and languages and skills and songs. They pay attention to details and to people's emotions. They want to learn, to understand. We think we're supposed to know everything, especially if we've uh, if we're in a comfortable spot, if we've been around a particular church for a long time, many of you have uh, your areas of interest at Trinity, and you know a lot about them. Maybe you have expertise and education in certain fields that help you serve here. Many of you have been here a very long time. You are experts at Trinity, and you are experts at Lutheranism. This gospel is encouraging us all to put aside everything we know, and be open and curious. What might God be doing next? What might be coming down the line? What might God have in mind for us that we don't already know? Is there someone we could ask to come alongside us in a certain ministry area to teach them what we know and to open ourselves to new questions and insights about other ways of doing things? The word for disciple is actually learner. There's always more to learn about the Bible, about ways to grow in faith. People we've known for years have stories and experiences we've never heard. How can we be ready to learn disciples like this little child? How can we open our hearts to Jesus' teaching? Much more in Jesus' day, Children were there to serve and help their family. But even today, children are bossed around and told what to do. They're told to make themselves useful and given chores and sent on errands. And we, too, should not be surprised that Jesus asks us to do thankless tasks that are below our station that no one ever sees. Jesus is the Son of God, and he's a servant walking around this earth in human form, scrounging for something to eat, being approached by all sorts of people making demands of him, healing, food, attention. We find Jesus washing the feet of his disciples, touching lepers, comforting widows, visiting a mother-in-law, multiplying loaves. People follow Jesus around to see what he can do for them. They flock to him to make him their servant, and Jesus serves. And he na never asks for anything back. He doesn't complain, but he does look for some moments of rest and prayer. Jesus comes to serve and asks us to also serve as his disciples. So we find ourselves Jesus' servant. Uh, we're asked to take the garbage out, to clean up the litter, to clean up human waste on church grounds. We're invited to be a servant, to notice people who are invisible, clerks and waiters and bus drivers and children, and to serve them, listen to them, invest in them, notice them, help meet their needs. We're challenged to take care of this beautiful world God made, to care for animals and plants and bodies of water that will never thank us. Jesus served, and we, as Jesus' disciples, serve. We're to be like the child, and we are to welcome the child, because Jesus is like the child. Jesus is vulnerable, curious, serving, not what you would expect from the Son of God, from a leader, from someone so powerful. But Jesus didn't come to collect power. Jesus came to give it away, to spread it out among those that didn't have any, to show us all how to let go of it, because that is also powerful. The heart of the gospel is that servanthood is about power in relationship, the power of giving, the power of dying to ourselves and our own desires and rising to new life in community, a much greater power, power with. The gospel writer Mark, his community was asking, and he is trying to answer in this gospel, since Jesus ascended and we can't see him, how can we receive him? 
By placing that child in their midst, Jesus is showing that Jesus is found in our midst, in all the people we didn't notice in our quest for greatness or power or stability. Jesus comes to us as a needy, curious, vulnerable child. Jesus gives us grace also to be that little child, beloved of God, to love as he loved us, to serve as he served us, to look to the fringes and ditches, to see him and know him and love him, to receive and be received in grace. We don't come to God trying to prove ourselves or our greatness. We come to God and we're humbled. We come to God in our need and vulnerability. And we find that God has received us as immature and weak as we are. And God tenderly washes our faces in our baptism. God sets a meal before us and strengthens us and feeds us in Holy Communion. God teaches us God's ways of servanthood. God gives us communities in which to serve and give our lives away. May the peace which passes all understanding keep our hearts and minds in Jesus the Christ. Amen. we pray for the church, the world, and all in need. God of community, we pray for the church around the world. Unite us in our love for you. Help us overcome our divisions that we are encouraged to work together for your sake. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God of creation, we pray for this hurting earth. Awaken in us a new desire to care for this world and empower us to support agencies, organizations, and individual efforts to heal our environment. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. God of cooperation, we pray for nations of the world embroiled in conflict. Inspire leaders to listen to each other and work toward peaceful solutions to disagreements. Protect the vulnerable, especially children, who cannot find safety in their home or country. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. God of comfort, we pray for all who live with mental or physical illness. Help them find appropriate care. Bring healing and wholeness when the path forward seems bleak. For all affected by ongoing wildfires, for continued relief efforts following the earthquakes in Haiti and Mexico, for relief efforts following Hurricane Ida, Tropical Storm Nicholas, and other major storms, for the work of Lutheran disaster response, for the Afghan people and all living there during this time of political turmoil and conflict, for our Jewish siblings who have recently observed the holy day of Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. Be with also those we name now, aloud or quietly, in our hearts. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. God of compassion, we pray for the young people of this congregation. Renew in us your call to welcome the children in our midst. As they grow, strengthen their faith and our commitment to them. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. 
God of consolation, we give you thanks for our loved ones who have died and pray for all who grieve today. Shine your grace on all your saints. Lord, in your mercy, Into your hands, gracious Lord, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy through our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. And now we invite you to share the peace of Christ with the world around you. The peace of Christ is with you always. And also with you. This is the time that we would normally be receiving the offering, and so we thank you for all your general fund contributions, especially that have helped to decrease our deficit for the year. As we come to this time of Holy Communion, I want to invite you to have some bread, a cracker or a tortilla, something bread-like will be just fine to share Holy Communion. Some wine or juice would also be good. All are invited to share in Holy Communion, the true body and blood of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Wherever you are, you are welcome to join us. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is indeed right, our duty and our joy, that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God, through our Savior Jesus Christ, who on this day overcame death and the grave and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. And so with all the choirs of angels, with the church on earth and the host of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. <laughs> Merciful God, heaven and earth are full of your glory. In great love you sent to us Jesus, your Son, who reached out to heal the sick and suffering, who preached good news to the poor, and who on the cross opened his arms to all. In the night of his suffering, our Savior Jesus took bread and gave thanks, broke it and gave it for all to eat, saying, This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup and gave thanks to God and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. 
Do this for the remembrance of me. Remembering, therefore, his death, resurrection, and ascension, we await his coming in glory. Pour out upon us the spirit of your love, O Lord, and unite the wills of all who share this heavenly food, the body and blood of Jesus Christ, our Savior, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be all honor and glory, now and forever. Amen. Gathered into one by the Holy Spirit, let us pray as Jesus taught us, in whichever language or version you prefer. God, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Come to the banquet, for now all is ready. The body of Christ given for you. The blood of Christ shed for you. God of abundance, with this bread of life and cup of salvation, you have united us with Christ, making us one with all your people. Now send us forth in the power of your spirit, that we may proclaim your redeeming love to the world and continue forever in the risen life of Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Blessing of God who provides for us, feeds us, and journeys with us be upon you now and forever. Go in peace, you are the body of Christ. Thanks be to God. Mm -hmm. 